as we prepare ourselves to hear God's word to us for this morning, I invite you to join me in prayer. Holy God, as we still ourselves to hear your word this morning, may we catch a glimpse of your spirit, your hope, Inspire these words, let them seep deep into our souls, that seeds may be planted within, and that in time, through your watering and through the power of your Son, they may grow within us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture this morning is from the prophet Isaiah. In the ninth chapter, you've heard this scripture once already through our Advent candles. We will hear it again, and we will be reading verses 1 through 4 in the ninth chapter of Isaiah. Hear God's word to us. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. For the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Next, we turn to our New Testament, the Gospel of John, in chapter 16, verses 19 through 24, and I'd like you to hear these words um, from an interpretation that uses the New International Version as we imagine Jesus talking to his disciples the last night that he is with them before his arrest. Kyle, would you play that for us, please? I don't know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to question him. I said, in a little while you will not see me, and then a little while later you will see me. Is this what you are asking about among yourselves? I am telling you the truth. You will cry and weep, but the world will be glad. You will be sad, but your sadness will turn into gladness. When a woman is about to give birth, she is sad because an hour of suffering has come. But when the baby is born, she forgets her suffering because she is happy that a baby has been born into the world. That is how it is with you. Now you are sad, but I will see you again and your hearts will be filled with gladness, the kind of gladness that no one can take away from you. When that day comes, you will not ask me for anything. I am telling you the truth. The Father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, so that your happiness may be complete. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I enjoyed being pregnant, especially the first time. I received these weekly emails, and so joy and excitement overcame me every time. I received another email that, that told me about, you know, what week my baby was in and how big it was, you know, the size of a grape or the size of a, you know, tennis ball, whatever it was at the time, and what developments were occurring in that tiny body. I was fortunate not to have any true difficulties or problems during pregnancy, but nevertheless, as I got closer to the due date, I got more and more anxious, and questions started to rise. You know, like, well, what was it going to be like, and, and, and when and how was this birth going to happen, and, you know, how much was it going to hurt, and, 
you know, the most important question, could, could I stand the pain that went along with it? Because you see, for humans and for most life, to create new life, you have to go through pain. New life, birth, birthing new life is not easy. Epidural or no epidural. And so perhaps that's why Jesus uses this whole image of a woman in labor, a woman who is about to give birth to new life, to describe not just what's going to happen to him, but what's going to happen to his disciples. He talks about how, you know, in a little while you're not going to see me, But then after another little while, then you will see me. And you can imagine the disciples are confused. And and what are you talking about, Jesus? And so he tries to give an example that, well, is something people can relate to, that you know about, a woman giving birth. He was trying to give them an inkling, a clue, an understanding about what they were going to go through in the days to come. And so Jesus is about to die. He's about to be arrested in a couple hours and tried and put on the cross. And then in a little while, the disciples will see him again, right after the resurrection, after the tomb is empty. And so Jesus reminds them that that this is also just like nature. This is how new life comes into the world. This journey from sorrow or anguish or pain that then gives birth and leads into the joy of new life. And so he tells them that just as a woman goes through the pain and the anguish when giving birth to her child, after a short while, easy for him to say, But after a short while, that pain, that anguish, that anxiety soon gives way to new birth, new life that she then cradles in her arms. The disciples, well actually all of humanity, were about to give new life, about to be given new life through the birth pains that Jesus was willing to go through on the cross. So that movement from pain and sorrow into joy and new life is found throughout Scripture, including the Old Testament. A woman in labor is used twice to illustrate how this new Jerusalem will be born, how new life will be brought to Israel. You may even recall the the Scripture from Psalm 30, right? Weeping lingers in the night, but what? Joy comes in the morning. And so this journey from darkness, from weeping, from pain, that eventually breaks forth into joy, is a a journey, a movement throughout Scripture. We even read in our passage of Isaiah, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. This is one of those passages that's often used today on the first Sunday of Advent because it reminds us about the prophecies of the Old Testament. It reminds us about the prophets who said what would be coming and that even though darkness is now, a light will shine and we know what happens on Christmas Day. We know the light that is to come, the light that comes into the world, and darkness will not overcome it. But when you're walking in darkness, you need those prophecies. You need those people to say, it won't be like this forever. The people walking in darkness. Have you ever tried to walk in darkness? I mean, you're groping around with your hands trying to feel things so you don't stub your toe on your dresser or something. Or, or maybe you're, you're walking very cautiously, trying not to trip over what might be on the floor. Walking in darkness is slow, painstakingly slow, as you grope trying to figure out what obstacles might be in front of you, trying, you're trying to 
a void. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, but before that light comes, they had to walk in darkness. And they had to walk for a long time before that light came. And that next phrase says, those who lived in a land of deep darkness, not just darkness, but deep darkness, on them light has shined. What's it like to live in deep darkness? Maybe it's a little like the words that we find on the front of our bulletin cover. You know, the theme there is waiting. But if you read what's underneath that, maybe it's a little like walking in darkness. It says, the silence, the silence since the astounding proclamation of the prophets centuries before has been deafening. The children of God have relied more on the ritual of the law than the reality of the Lord. The world is waiting in solemn stillness, but heaven is as distant as the ancient promises. All of that is about to change. Living in deep darkness means holding on to hope when there's no reason to. Living in deep darkness means living in anticipation, expectation that God is going to do something in that darkness at some point, in some way, that light is on its way. Living in deep darkness means believing it's not always going to be like this. Advent the four weeks before Christmas is about a movement from darkness to light. But it takes time, and it takes walking in darkness for a while before Christmas comes, before the light is born into this world. Advent is a journey from darkness to light which is why I chose this theme as my last sermon series in this Advent season, From Darkness to Light. Because many of us are walking in darkness. Some of us are walking in the darkness of grief as we approach the holiday season, and we are reminded of that empty chair at the table that person who will not be with us this year during the holidays and sharing the stories and eating and laughing. Some of us are in the darkness of financial struggles. And the holidays just remind us of, of presents that can't be bought or given or, or heating bills that can't be paid. And the pressure piles up just to get by and the holidays seem to make it Worse, and the joy that's all around us seems to elude us somehow. Some of us live in the, the darkness of depression, and as the holidays get closer, that darkness deepens as the skies grow grayer and the temperature grows colder. Some of us are living in that darkness of pain and ill health, and the cold doesn't make it any better, and, and the pain and struggle that you experience every day, nobody else knows about. And it means you can't travel like you would and maybe see people at the holidays, and, and it leaves you trapped, maybe feeling isolated or alone in a time where everyone gathers with family. Each of us have our own darkness that we experience that we walk in, that we live in every day, and sometimes the holidays make it worse, whether it's children who make bad choices, whether it's parents in ill health, whether it's unemployment or underemployment, health concerns, fear of the unknown, a spiritual dryness, feeling that God has abandoned you in this time. Whatever kind of darkness it is, we all walk in darkness. Some of us 
even today, live in a land of deep darkness. And the light hasn't quite gotten to us yet. And then there's the darkness, too, of saying goodbye to you in these next four weeks as we prepare to go our separate ways. Hopes and dreams unrealized, anxiety about the future, wondering who that next pastor will be and how everything will get done and who will do it. And there's so many questions and so many unknowns and so much darkness. But God doesn't leave us in the darkness. The people We people who are walking in darkness will see a great light. So Advent brings us hope. That's what today celebrates in our Advent candle ceremony. There is hope. There is a light in the midst of that darkness. There is a promise. And so we walk in the darkness knowing that every step gets us closer to the light that will come into this world. Have you ever thought about that all new life begins in the dark? I mean, a a seed planted underground, or an egg in its shell, a baby in the womb, a caterpillar in a cocoon. All new life begins in darkness. That's where the seeds are sown and nurtured. And what about the Christian life? I mean, you can't get to Easter Sunday without going through Good Friday. You can't get to resurrection without first going through the crucifixion, the darkness, the pain, the anguish of Good Friday and and the betrayal and everything that led up to that were the seeds the place where the seeds of new life were planted in order for Easter Sunday to rise three days later. Yes, sometimes we can miss those seeds of new life when the darkness is all-consuming and the pain is all we know and the anxiety is overwhelming and that's human. But as Christians, we know the darkness will not last forever, that we are on a journey. And every slow, painstaking step closer and farther we go will get us closer to the light. I want to give you an example of a woman in her times of darkness that seeds of new life and good were sown. You see, she saw her sister bravely fight breast cancer with all her heart and body and soul. And this sister, throughout her diagnosis and treatments and everything that she went through, was always trying to make other people feel better, was always concerned about the other women who were fighting breast cancer and not as concerned about her own situation And that concern for others even continued to her last days when she eventually lost that fight and she passed away. But this woman saw her sister fight so bravely and had so much compassion for other people, trying to make their lives better, that Nancy Brinker promised her sister that she would do everything in her power to help, to help ease those who are fighting breast cancer. So she, she founded this very small nonprofit organization. And now it's been over 30 years that the Susan G. Komen for the Cure has raised almost $2 billion for cancer research and has saved hundreds, perhaps thousands, of lives. So Susan's suffering and her compassion and her darkness led to new growth and new life in her sister and for thousands of other women who faced the same disease. And there are hundreds of examples of of parents or children or friends or, or siblings who have gone through suffering and tragedy and hard times, but out of that, new life eventually grew even in the most horrific of times. And it's, it's there in Scripture also. 
We read in Acts 8 how the church had been persecuted. I mean, Christians were literally dragged from their homes and killed on the streets. If you claimed to be a Christian, it was a death sentence in that time. And so the Christians scattered all over the world as they knew it. They left for safety, but as they left, they shared the gospel. And ironically, that is one of the major ways the gospel was spread in ancient times, is because they were fleeing this persecution, this suffering, this death sentence, and through that, they were proclaiming the gospel, and even the mortal enemy, Samaria, ended up becoming Christian because of this persecution, because of this darkness that they were facing. New life begins in the dark. And so as we journey individually and collectively in that kind of darkness, that unknown in this Advent season, I offer three cautions as we walk in that darkness. The first is that we should never think of that darkness as being caused by God. That God does not give us cancer or tragedy or persecution or illness or stress or grief or death or darkness to somehow teach us a lesson or help us grow. God works absolutely in those situations. But with free will being used inappropriately, with evil forces in this world, there is plenty of darkness to go around. So never think that those difficult, tragic, dark times are caused or given to us or sent to us by God. The second caution I offer is that just because we know or believe that the light is coming doesn't always make it easier to walk in that darkness. That pain and loneliness and anger and grief are all very real. And it doesn't mean that that we have this Pollyanna outlook that says, oh, well, it's okay, it doesn't matter. No, it's scary, those dark times. And we have that fear, that grief, slowly groping our way, putting one foot in front of the other, living just one day at a time. So may we never take that darkness lightly. Or may we never take seriously the darkness that someone else is going through. Yes, we believe there is a light, a joy that will come, but in the midst of the darkness, may we honor the pain that we or others may be walking through. And finally, our third caution is that that joy, that life, that new life that will come, it's not an instantaneous process. The the process, the walking, the darkness, it doesn't happen overnight. And so in the midst of the pain, we don't know how long it will last, and our timing is not God's timing, and God works in mysterious ways, and so we hold on and we keep on day after day. But we don't always know how that new life will come or when it will come. So as uncomfortable as it is, we stay in that darkness, believing and hoping new life will be born. All new life begins in darkness. It could be spiritual darkness, feeling that God has abandoned you. It could be emotional darkness as you grieve the loss of a loved one or live in a strained relationship with a family member. It could be physical darkness as your, as your body starts to, to break down or feel the pain of disease. You may be in darkness now, or you may be able to look back, but Jesus says to his disciples, Jesus says to us as disciples, so you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Jesus is with us, no matter how dark it gets, 
no matter what we're going through. My friends, new life begins in the dark. Your darkness, my darkness, the churches, the worlds. So fear not. The light will shine. And one day, one day, the darkness will not overcome it. Hallelujah. Amen.